Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar by the Medical Schools Council. My name is Lucy, and I'm really pleased to and excited to chair this session today because this is our first careers webinar, which is on two different medical specialties, radiology and pathology. So if you're, if you're watching this webinar today, you probably know that there are many different specialties in medicine, ranging from psychiatry, surgery, pathology, through to radiology, general practice, obstetrics, and gyne gynecology. So if you're watching, it's likely that you want to find out a bit more about the specialties covered today, but also a bit more about what becoming a doctor might involve, whichever specialty you end up in, because at this stage, there's no need for you to have a firm idea for which specialty you might like to go into. Because with every role as a doctor, you can make a real difference to people's lives, whichever role you end up in. So you've probably already done some initial research and you think that a career in medicine might be for you. You may know that the training is in three stages. So there's, it starts with medical school or university, then it goes on to foundation training and then through to specialty training. So today I hope that Jade and Annie can give an insight into their path into medicine and give us a bit of a taste for what their role involves within their individual specialties. But before we, we start and before I introduce them, I'd just like to run through how you can use the software in case you are not familiar with Zoom. So unfortunately, we cannot see you or hear you. So you do need to place any questions you have within the Q&A. And you can find that on the bottom of your screen. There's a, a button there which says Q&A. And if you pop your questions in there, then, then I'll receive them and, and I'll, I'll ask them to the panelists later on in the webinar. Um, so just to get started, Jade, would you like to introduce yourself? So hi, I'm Jade and I'm a radiology doctor and I'm in training at the moment. And just give you a sort of like a little brief history of like my journey. So I grew up in Bristol and then I went to medical school up in Manchester. And then I went back down to London for my foundation training. So that's the two years after I finished medical school. And now I'm in Cambridge and that's when I'm at the beginning of my radiology training. So I've sort of been traveled a lot, been all over the place, different experiences. And medicine for me is sort of, I had two career options when I was younger and I thought either teaching or medicine, I couldn't decide. And for me, it was medicine because I got to combine both being a doctor and teaching. So that's how I got there. But there was a few sort of hiccups and it was like a roller coaster along the way. So happy to answer any questions and tell you a bit more at the end. Thanks, Jay. That's fantastic. Uh, and Annie, would you also like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Lucy. So my name is Dr. Annie Crest. Just like Jade, I'm a junior doctor, but I work in histopathology, which is one of the subspecialties of pathology. My little journey is that I was born in Eastern Europe. And when I was a child, we moved to Northern Ireland. And when I applied to medicine, I got accepted into University of Aberdeen. So that's where I went. And I really enjoyed Scotland. Um, unfortunately, I met a Yorkshire man who um, <laughs> encouraged me to move here to Sheffield, where I have done my two years of foundation training. And I really enjoyed it here. So I decided to stay here and do my specialty training here. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to represent because I came from kind of a working class background. None of my parents are doctors. So if anyone tells you that you don't belong in medicine because you're not rich or your dad is not a doctor, that's simply not true. Um, and I'm a living example of this. Thanks, Annie, that's fantastic. Um, so we have a couple of presentations before we get started and, and we'll move into your questions. So Jade, would you like to share your presentation first? Yes, sure. So this is going to be a presentation on radiology and just a little bit to give you an overview. And some of you may know a little bit more than others, but it's just starting from the beginning and working up with sort of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is me in the radiology department in Cambridge. And so what is a radiologist? What does a radiologist do? So we're specially trained to interpret, interpret images and that can be X-rays, MRI, CTs, and there's a whole host of different imaging and we call them modalities. And not only do we diagnose different conditions and diseases, we actually do more than that and we do treatments as well. 
So that's a lot of what the interventional radiologist does, and they do lots of different procedures, but some of the diagnostic radiologists also do some, maybe like a drainage if someone had a really big abscess, but it was, you needed some imaging to actually see the abscess clearly, so you don't get the big blood vessels, for example. And radiologists don't just look at imaging, but they also perform the different studies, like ultrasound. Today I had an ultrasound session, and that involved me scanning someone's liver, and that involved me traveling all around the different, or the hospital, the different wards to do different ultrasound scans as well. And then fluoroscopy is one you might not have heard of, but we, it's basically x-rays, but you're doing lots of different x-rays while you get someone to do something like swallow a drink, and I'll show you some images a bit later as well. So that's a few of the things that radiologists do day to day. And also at the end of it, we write a report and we'll send it off to the clinicians. That could be the GP, it could be one of the doctors on the wards. So they, can, they will have access to the imaging sometimes, but they will also have access to our report to actually know what's going on in detail. So if we go on to the next slide, we see a lot of x-rays and these are lots of the plain films we tend to call it because x-rays is more of the beam and that's what's giving us the image. So we see a lot of broken bones and lots of patients that go through A&E and we're making a diagnosis and here we can see there's a fracture and this is the ulna and the fracture's right here. But sometimes they can be really, really small, really difficult to see. And the dots on the ward, they may get the image, but not they may not be able to actually see where the fracture is. So we're there to point out the really fine detail as well. And we're not just looking at images all day, but there's practical aspects of radiology. And here is quite difficult to understand ultrasound, but this is an ultrasound scan. And we've got dark gray, so we can see the organ here. And we've got this line here, which is light gray. And that's where we can see the needle going in to take a biopsy. So if there's a lesion in one of the organs that we want to see and we want to know a bit more information about it, we'll take the biopsy, which will help with the diagnosis. And then it'll be up to our friends, the histopathologist to actually give us the diagnosis. And there's also aspects of treatment that you can get involved with. And this is not at my stage, but further down the line, here, the images look a little bit confusing, but this is actually going into someone's brain here. And this is one of the blood vessels that go up into the brain. And you can see these two little, it's like an M shape up here. And these shouldn't be here. It should be nice and smooth and straight, just like this blood vessel here. And what the doctors have actually done, they've gone into the artery and they put like a little catheter all the way up the artery to there. And they put some coils in. And that's what's made it go from black here to white. And the reason they've done this is because this sort of M-shaped bubble here is an aneurysm and they can bleed and it can lead to bleeds in the brain. So they put coils in to prevent these aneurysms bursting and bleeding. So there's lots of interventions that can be done and the neuroradiologist would do this for us. So the different techniques. So we have x-ray as we've seen before. So this is a fracture we've got across the humerus here. And this is just to show the age range that we look at. So it's from it's a neonatal. We don't do the obstetric scanning. That's what the obstetricians do in our hospital. And we go all the way up to the elderly patients. So it's very, very varied. And this is what I mentioned earlier, fluoroscopy. I didn't know what it was until I started radiology. But what we do, there's me in the image here. There's a little machine. And with that machine, we can direct where this machine moves. And this is where the x-rays are sort of made and this is where the x-rays are detected and this is where the patient would be lying down so we're taking lots of x-rays over a period of time and that's to see how different um, systems in the body work so if the patient was having difficulty swallowing we can get them to drink a dye and this is the dye going down their gullet their esophagus and then we can see if there's anything that's stopping that fluid going down so that anything's stopping that dye going down and that can give the doctors some information about what's happening there's also CTs, which is done a lot in trauma and big sort of instances that happen when patients come into A&E, very frequently a CT may be done. And MRI we rely on as well, but lots of the time it's the specialists that decide to order the MRIs. So it's generally not something that would be done when the patient comes to A&E, but further on in their stay, they may get an MRI depending on what their symptoms are. And then there's radionuclide radiology. This can be in black and white and gray like here, or it can be in color as well. And the reason that we do this is often to look at the function to see what's happening with the organ, whereas lots of the other images, like I've showed you, CT and MRI, actually look at the anatomy a lot more. And also both can see sort of the pathology as well. And then we looked a little bit at ultrasound, but here's another image, and this is the kidney here. So if you see the black, dark black, this is the cortex at the outside of the kidney. And here, where it's a little bit lighter, we've got the inside of the kidney. And we've got some blue and we've got some red and this is showing the blood vessels 
and we're able to detect, it's using sound waves, we can detect this and in the pulse we can see this archery and we can see the blood flow. So ultrasound is one that we learn, it takes a long time to learn, I'm at the beginning of that stage which is why I'm always with one of the seniors and there's so much teaching in radiology which is what I really like. And you can have combinations of different types of scans. So here we've got, this is going through someone's chest and we can see that there is some color in it. So that's from the radionuclide imaging that we mentioned, but it's also a CT scan as well. So it's a combination. And that's one of the great sort of parts of radiology is that we can, it's really in a, innovative and you can mix different modalities together. And sort of one of the questions I asked myself at the beginning is why clinical radiology? Why do you want to be a radiologist? And there's lots of teamwork involved, which I love. You might hear lots of people saying that you're often on your own as a radiologist, but what I found is that there's always someone to go to, I'm always in a team. And the team is not just doctors. We have healthcare assistants. I work with nurses, I work with radiographers, I work with sonographers. There's a vast amount in the multidisciplinary team. We work with the porters as well. So there's a big, big team of people and it's good to look into all the different roles to see what fits you best as well. And radiology is a puzzle. It's always a puzzle. You're trying to put all the pieces together of what's going on on the ward, what the blood results show. You also may have the histopathology results as well. And you're just putting all the pieces together to make this sort of image make sense in the larger picture and how, see how it's going to improve the patient care. And as I've already mentioned, I've got the light bulb just to say it's really innovative. There's lots of new advances in radiology. It's actually only one subspecialty, which is interventional, which you can see in the image from the Royal Free here. But actually, you can have lots of different special interests and so name an organ, name a body system, and there will be a special interest there. So there's lots of variety, which is why we've got these M&Ms. And the variety of radiology is what, why, one of the reason, main reasons why I picked it. And you can work in paediatrics, even though it's not a specialty on its own, it's for special interest. You can do the gastrointestinal system. You can just fit whatever you want, whatever you're interested in, which you actually see as like a medical specialty on its own, you can work in radiology. And sometimes you can combine the two if you're interested in a couple of them. And there's a black box, you might be wondering why that's on there, but that's meant to be there. That's not like a technical hitch, but lots of people say you're in a dark room for radiology all of the time. And this is completely not true. So don't believe in the stereotypes. Once you get work experience or you're, when you're a medical student, just try and get into the department and see what the role is like for yourself because you'll see the variety that it offers. And this is my week this week. And this is just to show you sort of what it looks like. I'm in my first year of radiology. So I start each day at 8.15, except for Wednesday morning, which I had off. And I have teaching in the morning, which is by a consultant. And we get to ask lots of questions. They show us lots of cases and it's really, really interactive. And then my sort of work starts at nine o'clock where in the beginning of the week I was in the CT department and that was me writing reports for inpatients and also patients that just came in for their scan and then went home, so outpatients as well. And in the afternoons, I've had ultrasound sort of all of the days because I'm on my ultrasound block at the moment and we rotate around all the different special interests. And then I've had fluoroscopy this morning, which I led and I had one of the other ST ones that I was teaching. And then I'll be looking at x-rays so and plain films. I'll be looking at tomorrow morning and I'll have ultrasound again in the afternoon. So just a really brief overview of the career path. So as a medical student, I spent, I did six years. So I did the five years of the traditional medicine sort of course. And then I did neuroscience in between as well. And then I did, like I said before, I did the two years as a foundation doctor going through many different specialties in London. And now I'm at the beginning of my specialty training. But importantly, you can take a career break, you can do different things, and you can get involved maybe in leadership, you might want to get involved in some teaching, or you might just want to take out some time for yourself, because it's quite a long path, as you can see. And that's okay, you can do, you can structure your career how you want to structure it. And that's really important. And then in a few years time, in like four and a half years time, I'll be a consultant. And then let's not think about retirement quite yet. So Radiopedia is where I got all the images from here. So please take a look at the website. You can just look through lots of like chest x-rays or anything and just have a look and see what you think about different things to have to come to a diagnosis. But it's just quite interesting to have a look. And then the Royal College of Radiology also has some information about careers in general. This is not to sort of make you a radiologist, but if you're interested, that's great. But it's just to think about the different specialties that are actually out there and the ones that are sometimes not talked about the most. And if you want to find out more specifically about radiology, I've started a network called Wine and Participations Medics Network, and that's for 
people that come from groups that are not as represented in medical school and in the doctor's workforce. So I'm sort of the first person in my family to go to university. I am, came from a low income area, um, family with um, low income as well. So it's just really important to make sure that all the medical students and all of the doctors are representative of society as in general. So if you have any questions, that's how you can get in contact with the organisation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. That was absolutely fantastic. And I would just recommend to anyone watching, do go on the, the Widen Participation Medics Network website. They have loads of um, free advice available there on many of the questions that you're asking today. So really do check that out. Annie, would you like to share your presentation now? Certainly, thank you. So this is a presentation taken from the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, so I will focus more on his pathology just because it's a specialty closer to me and I have a lot more experience in it compared to the other specialties, but we'll cover the majority of the big areas. So um, looking at Korean pathology, uh, a few years ago, the Royal College of Pathologists just went down the street and they asked general public, what do you think when we say the word pathologist? What comes to your mind? What kind of things do you think an like pathologist does? And lo and behold, the majority of people said something along the lines of CSI, forensic pathology. And I can see there's already comments in the question box about forensic pathology. So um, it's probably the most well represented part of pathology in the TV and popular culture. However, it actually makes possibly one of the smallest parts of the workforce in pathology. So what does pathology mean? It, it means a study of disease. Um, and please ignore kind of the, the top part of this presentation because it's not entirely correct. To be a pathologist, you do have to be a doctor. Um, and it's a question that gets asked in, in the interview when you apply for specialty training, why pathologists need to be a doctor. Nowadays, there are uh, biomedical scientists who become very well trained within um, working in the histopathology department and um, they can perform some of the duties of histopathologists which were previously um, obviously done by the doctor. So they do um, some benign tissue reporting and they do a bit of um, cut up and specimen processing but to be a fully rounded um, pathologist you do have to be a doctor. So why do we need pathologists and what do they do? So together with, uh, with radiology colleagues, we do um, look at kind of the diagnostic medicine side. So we look to prevent, diagnose and treat diseases. So I'm guessing in the audience, we do have quite a wide female representation tonight. So I'm guessing a lot of the girls in the audience would have had the HPV vaccination. So that is aimed to prevent a disease, prevent cervical cancer. And um, when you get to 25 years of age, you will get a letter through your letterbox inviting you to a cervical smear. And um, that is aimed to diagnose any problems, any potential early signs of uh, cervical cancer. And if there's someone unfortunate to have this diagnosis to be made, then pathologist will be looking and guiding the treatment uh, and making sure um, that the, the lady gets the best treatment that they, that they can get. So looking at histopathologist, the histo means tissue. So um, the study of disease of the tissue. So we're looking at different kinds of tissue, whatever you can take from the body, we can look at it. We we'll also look at the cells. It's called, a, so it's um, a subspecialty of histopathology called cytopathology, cyto means cells. A lot of the times we use microscopes and um, when radiologists get joked about being, you know, sitting alone in a dark room, the same gets joked about his pathologist that we're sitting probably in a better lit, better lit room, but still sort of by yourself, looking at microscope all day, shifting glass. That's nothing exciting. That's really not the case. You do look a lot in your microscope. You do have to use a microscope a lot, but you also get a lot of interaction with your colleagues and with um, biomedical scientist colleagues. You're not alone and it's quite an interactive specialty. People love to go from um, 
within a department and speak to each other, show the cases, um, get second opinions. It was very well accepted. So you, it's, it's very seldom you sit in your room by yourself. Um, so what they do, we'll look at the tissues, as I said. So in the image on the right, that looks like, I'm guessing a skin specimen that we can receive from dermatology colleagues. So what we do is we look at it, we measure it, we describe what we're seeing, we cut it up to make it into slides. The slides get processed in the laboratory and then the pathologist gets the slides which are seen on the left side of the picture here. And um, the histologist looks under the microscope and tries to make sense of what they see. So a bit like radiology, it's a putting things into perspective, into looking at, at, at a bigger picture. So you're not just looking at the cells in microscope. Yeah, you also need to employ your previous medical knowledge and your knowledge of how it works in the, on the wards to make, um, uh, to, to make sense of what you're looking at and to advise the clinical team looking after the patient how to best approach the management. So histopathologists and radiologists are at the very heart of manage, management of cancer patients. It's not always cancer. Sometimes um, samples of tissue get sent just to make sure that things are all right. And um, there are many benign or non-cancerous um, conditions that histopathologists look at. And sometimes it can be very tricky to distinguish between benign and cancerous. And that's where special tests such as genetics and different stainings and different procedures come into play. Also, the big part of histopathologists is post-mortem work. Nowadays, it's optional. So if you feel a bit squeamish, if you don't like it, you don't have to carry it on into your work. It is optional part of training. So for the first two years, you have to do, you have to have some kind of exposure to postmortem or autopsy, as it's called. If you don't like it, it's completely optional. You can drop it and you don't have to carry on. If you absolutely love it and you want to do it, again, that's absolutely fine. There are um, pathologists in this country who only do postmortem work. But equally, there are also pathologists who just look, um, who don't do autopsy work. Um, and there's lots of people who mix, mix and match. So lots of variation. Skills required. This is a bit of a repetitive slide because a lot of the skills are very much similar to a lot of the doctors and um, a lot of the specialties in in, in the pathology in the pathology field. Of course, you need a good attention to detail because you're looking at the slides, looking at the pictures, you need to recognize patterns. So attention to detail is very, very important. Being able to make decisions under pressure, um, I wouldn't say it applies very much to histopathology because um, a lot of the times you can take time to look at the slides to show your colleagues to request special things. So there's not a lot of kind of working under pressure involved. Um, communication skills, you're working with your colleagues, you're working with scientists, you're working with medics, and you very much form um, an important part of multidisciplinary process. So you need to have very good communication skills. Obviously respect everyone. Um, and as we said, you need to be working um, as part of the team. So hematologists, hematologists are doctors who look at the blood to make a diagnosis. Hematologists will work on the wards to look after the patients um, and equally they'll go in the clinics and do a lot of outpatient work. They do have a um, laboratory component to their job. They will look uh, at blood samples from patients to make a diagnosis and they will also be involved in transfusion services. So making sure the blood transfusion happens safely and maintaining adequate amount of stocks to ensure should something unfortunate happen and um, the hospital is able to supply enough um, blood. So uh, hematologists mainly look at people with blood disorders and that includes things like anemia if you have low hemoglobin levels for various reasons, um, could be genetic, could be a part of other disease, uh, looking at leukemias which are blood cancers essentially, thrombosis which are blood clots, some people are predisposed to having lots of blood clots and it can be life-threatening and the opposite such as bleeding problems like haemophilia. As we covered before a lot of skills are quite transferable between specialties um, and of course as before you need to have good attention to detail you need to be very empathetic 
if you're dealing with people who have cancers, you need to be able to break those bad news in quite empathetic way. And because of the nature of your work, hematology affects very young patients and it affects very old patients. So our next specialty are medical microbiologists. So now the training is combined with infectious diseases. So as part of your training, you do spend some time on the, on the ward and you spend some time in the lab. Should you decide to become a medical microbiologist rather than an infectious diseases doctor, you will spend the majority of time in the lab. You will be looking at um, kind of agar plates and uh, different cultures, uh, whether it's bacterial, or viral um, or fungal and trying to decide what's the best treatment for this patient. If somebody has some weird and wonderful infection or it's something unusual, very hard to treat, micro, medical microbiologists are at the heart of this decision because they're the ones who advise what the best medication would be for that patient. Um, they're all also quite present on the ward. So um, it's quite usual for medical microbiologists to have ward rounds, um, especially in some areas like critical care, where patients do tend to be quite vulnerable. They'll have a walk around, make sure everyone's covered. They'll also be present in wards such as orthopedics because infection in the bone is very, very hard to treat. So they want to prevent as much as possible. Um, but should this happen, they'll be there to guide and support you. They're very supportive in, um, in their help when you're working as a junior doctor and you're really stuck with a patient and you're very worried about them. They're very, um, very good, good specialty to speak to. Um, they're also very important in combating, combating antimicrobial resistance. So we see in a lot of media that the world is going to end because there's a virus going to come and turn us, in, turn us into zombies. But actually, probably the human demise will come because of antimicrobial resistance and we'll run out of um, antibiotics to cure our, our infections. Uh, and the very the, the job of medical microbiologists is to advise what the most appropriate way to manage infection, not to try and treat everything with antibiotics um, and, and try to prevent as much as possible. Okay, so as we said, the work, the work in the labs, the work in, um, in the wards as well. And as before, you have to be a team player. You have to have a lot of patience and you have to be a very good, good communicator because you're there to advise and support clinical team. Clinical biochemists, so they're sort of the, the science, the scientists um, of, of doctors. So they look at different bodily fluids and the composition of it. And um, they're looking at kind of biochemical composition of that, such fluids. So they'll look at typically blood, it could be saliva, could be um, urine, et cetera, et cetera. So if there's any kind of imbalance, they'll be the ones to advise clinical team how to deal with it. So most common things is, is um, it's when you come to the doctors and advise in bloods, um, you will do kind of a biochemical profile screen, looking at different ions and salts in the body, making sure that everything's in order, making sure your kidneys are working fine. And if they're not, um, clinical biochemists are there to help you and, um, and advise you. So again, they work in the labs. However, they're also, uh, quite an important members of the team when we're looking at some kind of subspecialized diseases like hereditary um, forms of very high lipids in the blood. So they're there to kind of guide the treatment. They're, um, they'll run clinics and do the outpatient treatment. They're also there to support people who, um, for one reason or the other, cannot eat food and they have to get all the nutrients through the vein. Um, as you can imagine, it's very specialized the treatment has to be um, very carefully selected and monitored. It could be temporary or it could be long term. So they're there to um, prescribe this treatment to make sure um, the patient is supported and they're getting all the nutrients. Um, and obviously they discuss abnormal results. Um, so you, it's not uncommon that you get a, a phone call saying that this salt level is out of balance and it's quite dangerous and we need to treat it as soon as possible. And as we said before, very good communication skills. You speak into patients, you speak into clinical team. Um, and I for detail, it's also about pattern recognition. Um, you have to be 
you have to be again good leader good um good with organizing because you are um leading different teams um labs and in outpatients and um on awards so immunologist so they're the uh, doctors who deal with immune problems as it says in the name so things like allergies are probably the most common things that they address so if people have got um, immune deficiencies or the immune system is overreactive to um, something that it shouldn't be they're there to guide the treatment um, they run allergy clinics um, they uh, can advise medical microbiologists as well because penicillin is one of the most common antibiotic prescribed however there's so many people with penicillin allergy they're there to um, sometimes suggest treatment for it. So sometimes when you introduce things in very, very small amounts and try to build it up, um, you're trying to trick the immune system of not to react towards penicillin because it might be the most appropriate drug to treat such infection. Um, they're also important for um, all other autoimmune conditions such as um, rheumatoid, for example. They're there to kind of develop um, and guide treatment. Um, immune deficiency states like HIV, uh, again, they can advise on treatment, they can run clinics with patients, so outpatient clinics, or they can advise clinical team on how to best manage those patients. And um, um, they're also there to support and um, advise and treatment for transplant. Um, so kidney transplant, heart transplant, lung transplants, they're, they're there to um, best advise what the best uh, treatment to use. And as before, a lot of problem solving skills, a lot of communication skills are required. So you see a lot of those skills are quite repetitive. So pathology, there are um, almost 20 specialties. It's quite a broad um, range of specialties are covered under the umbrella of pathology, um, including veterinary pathology. If you want to be a veterinary pathologist, you have to be a vet first. And, um, so you have to get this decision right. Um, there are also um, dental pathologists. So again, you have to be a dentist first before you become a dental pathologist. Um, and the majority of other um, specialties are actually subspecialties of histopathology. So there's dermatopathology, look at skin. Um, there's neuropathology, looking at the uh, kind of the brain, the spinal cord tissue. As I said, there's cytopathology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we have covered the majority, um, the bulk of the specialties uh, that comes under the pathology, uh, the umbrella term. So, as I said before, pathology is very, very important, together with radiology, to guide the treatment um, of, the, um, of the patient. Almost every patient who comes into A&E will get some kind of blood test. They will get an, um, some kind of x-ray before they get admitted to the ward. And a lot of this gets gets processed by the diagnostic team, so such as pathologists or radiologists, and they're very much in the key or in the center of um, treating the patient. So just because we're not always there with the patient doesn't mean we don't influence their treatment. And as it says in the bottom, only 1% of pathologists work in forensic pathology. It's a very su small subspecialty. You don't get employed by NHS, you get employed by the home office and there's not that many jobs around, unfortunately. So, uh, so it's, as I said, it's a very small subspecialty. And if you're going into medicine just to be a forensic pathologist, be prepared to, to um, change your mind. Um, and I think that is it. So to find out more, you can look at Royal College of Pathologists. They'll discuss different careers in pathology. Um, you can, again, contact your local medical school to find out about more. Um, if there's a local hospital and there's a local pathology lab, histopathology is biochemistry, they'll be more than happy to talk to you and answer your questions. Thank you very much. Now I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Annie. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm really surprised and amazed by how many different subspecialties there are in, in, in um, pathology. So thank you for that. So I'm going to go on to our questions. I see we've got quite a few coming through in our Q&A. And one of the ones which is coming up a lot is how do you know which 
specialty is right for you. And I think I'll just add to that. At this stage, if you're in year 12, don't be worrying that you need to have it all figured out. It, that, that's not what's required at this stage. But how did you, I guess, get into pathology or radiology? How did you find out that that was what you wanted to go into later on? Yes, so absolutely, you do not have to know what you want to do. It, it really doesn't matter. And in fact, it's better not to have a prefixed idea in your head that you really want to be this and nothing else. It's, it's good to come into medicine having an open mind, an open approach. I want to try everything. I want to see how it works. I want to have a flavor of everything and then make up my mind when I have all the information available. If you're coming to interview, they might ask you what kind of specialty you're interested in. It's absolutely fine to sit in the fence. It's good to show up your experience in, um, say you've sat in a GP practice and you really enjoyed it. Absolutely fine to show off that part. Um, but a, a, a lot of medical students will come into medical school want to be surgeons. So there has been some research done in my university. They found that 50% of people um, when they start medicine want to do surgery and this drops dramatically by year five after people had very good exposure to other subspecialties and to sort of figure out their personal skills um, and how it matches to different specialties within medicine. And actually the majority of people, you know, a lot of people by the end of foundation training will take a break called an F3, your foundation year three is an official year three. Um, to go and explore themselves and try out different specialties and try some teaching, try some research, some sort of traveling um, before they commit to, you know, the specialty they're gonna spend next 40, 50 working years in your life. So I really want to do surgery when I came into medicine, typical. And then I changed my mind into, and I really liked a &E medicine. And then I realized, oh, I really, really enjoy my pathology lectures. And I decided to um, just spend some more time in the pathology lab because you just, you just don't get that exposure. And it's probably similar to Jade. You just don't get that exposure. Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in those specialties, go and bombard that professor who gave you that talk. Ask for experience. Ask for, ask for the audit. Ask for a placement. And spend some time in the department. And I absolutely enjoy spending my time there I thought the trainees were great they had the best time of their lives um everyone was great I really enjoyed what I was doing and I just stuck with it and pursued it um and you know all of that is not lost time if you realize actually I really like the idea of this specialty and it's not not really it and it's fine you know you figured it out thanks Annie and I, I think Jay, would you broadly agree with that? How did you sort of get into your yeah. into radiology? I definitely agree. I didn't really know radiology was a specialty when I was in year 12 or 13 and not probably for the first sort of part of medical school either. <laughs> so to be honest, it wasn't something I chose until after medical school. And it was when I was doing my foundation training. So someone asked what was foundation training, but it's two years. It can be a little bit longer as well, but you just change your different specialties after medical school and you just get to try out different specialties, see if you like it. And you spend four months generally, and then you swap over into a different specialty. And I, during my foundation year one, so my first year of doing that, I got to have a week doing whatever specialty I wanted and I chose radiology. And that was the time I got to spend time in the department, speak to all the consultants, speak to the trainees. And I just saw everyone was so happy <laughs> and it seemed a nice place to be a nice environment. And I just felt like it, something just clicked and I thought that's for me. But I wanted to do neurosurgery when I came into med school. I, I didn't get into medical school the first time. So I spent a year as a healthcare assistant working in neurosurgery theatres. And that's what I saw every day I was working. I say working with neurosurgeons, but I was like handing them things and helping with the different operations that were happening. And that's when I thought I wanted to do neurosurgery. And then I went to psychiatry. And then I thought that I wanted to do neurology. And then I chose something that no one never heard of, which was clinical neurophysiology. And then I ended up in radiology. So it's just very, very variable. No, you don't have to rush to choose. And as I answered in one of the questions as well, one of my we have a consultant now that's a radiology consultant. She went through the whole training pathway for neurology, became a neurology consultant and thought, actually, I want to do radiology. And then she trained in radiology. So you can change when you're a consultant, you can change whenever you want. Thanks, Jade. And I hear from so many medical students that have changed their mind four, five, six times. 
um, even just during medical school. And, you know, even then after that, they might change their minds again. So you really don't need to have it all figured out now. Don't feel that you do. So I'm looking at the questions here. There are a lot of questions about which can apply to both. They're asking what is the most rewarding part of your career? So Jade, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, for me, it's when you see a patient that just smiles or you feel like you've helped them on their journey in hospital. And that's what I find really, really rewarding. Whether that's just doing an ultrasound scan and giving them a relief that they haven't got a diagnosis they've been worrying about and stressing about for two weeks, that can be extremely rewarding. And just feel like, we do these really big team meetings where you'll have like a radiologist, you'll have maybe a surgeon, you'd have um, some of the research nurses, you'd have one of the pathologists, and it's just a really big team meeting. And when you see like everyone putting that bit of the puzzle together, I find that really, really rewarding. And you realize there's this one patient that we spend like up to 10 minutes sometimes talking about, and it's just amazing to think this is, we've got a plan for you and we can really make a difference together. That's the thing about any, in any specialty, you can make a real difference to patients' lives whichever part of medicine you're working in. Annie, what, what, what would be the most rewarding part for you? Well, it, it sounds very nerdy, but we get really excited when we see some people in a wonderful down a microscope, <laughs> when it's something very unusual. <laughs> um, uh, yes, so that is, at my stage, the most exciting part. Um, and usually consultants will come and give you kind of um, they'll come into the trainer's room and we'll say, I've got an interesting case, pass it around, guys, discuss it. So that's what I really enjoy. But I also, as Jade was saying, and you're talking about multidisciplinary meetings when you have people from different specialties and different healthcare professionals in one room, it's nice to follow, you know, if you're attending a, a, those meetings for weeks, you, you kind of follow the patient as well. So you see when you're when your diagnosis or when, you know the treatment is working and they're getting better so that is also quite rewarding because as I said before um, the diagnostic services are at the heart center of those those team meetings you cannot have one without a radiologist and, and pathologist present there. Thanks Annie. Um, so I'm looking at some of the more specific uh, specialty questions we've got here. There's one person asking this is for Jade. So they're asking, interventional radiology, can you explain more? And there's someone else who's asking, what is the difference between a radiologist and a radiographer? Okay. Would you like to tackle those? So, yeah, so interventional radiology and the diagnostic radiology, so it's sort of seen as two sort of subspecialties of radiology. And if you just went through the sort of the most common course, it's five years training in radiology, Whereas interventional radiology, you'll have an additional year, so it'll be six years in total, and it'll be sort of the latter three years that you're doing a lot more interventional. And what I mean by interventions, it's a bit like surgery, but it's basically through a pinhole. And you go through the blood vessels and you treat people by going through the blood vessels in the body. So generally you have people that do neuro, so people that focus on the head, and then you'll just have body as well. And it's a lot of like using dye, using, can be using x-rays to have a look and see what's happening or happening or the fluoroscopy. So you're doing lots of x-rays to follow. And then you can treat patients that way as well. So that's a lot intervention as I call it, sort of like pinhole surgery, but it's amazing what you can achieve through a pinhole. Thanks, Jane. And the second question, what was that word again? It was, uh, what's the difference between a radiologist and a radiographer? So it's different training paths and we work together really, really closely, but the roles are, can be quite different, but sometimes sort of at my early stage of the training as well, my role sort of overlaps and I get lots of teaching from radiographers, but a radiologist is a doctor, whereas a radiographer isn't, and that's the main sort of different difference. But when you have a report for uh, like, for example, for an X-ray, like I said before, it may be done by a radiographer and they can sign it off themselves and they have autonomy, or it may be done by a doctor. So there's some parts of the roles that overlap. But actually, if you ask a radiologist to go and take an x-ray and do, do that imaging, that's going to be very, very difficult. And they'll probably stand there saying, I don't know what to do and how to get the perfect image by doing that. But the radiographers will be really amazing at that. So there's different aspects of the role, but there's lots of information if you go onto the Royal College of Radiology website or if you go into NHS careers as well, there's lots of information that can tell you a little bit more how they sort of overlap and how they work together and their main differences as well. Thanks, Jade. Um, and I think it's important just to note that the healthcare professionals do work together. So you'll be working with people from lots of different 
um, not just walks of life, but also who have different skills and, and, and stuff. So um, that is something really important to consider when you're looking at a career in medicine. You're not just working with other doctors, you're working with the rest of the healthcare team. So I have a couple of questions for you, Annie, on pathology. Um, there are a lot of people who are interested in the difference between real life pathology and TV. <laughs> and I think you've kind of half covered that. Um, we were talking about forensic pathology and the fact that it's not as, as widespread as people think it is. Um, but would you just like to cover that? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling to think what other pathologists are quite represented in the media. And I sort of cannot really think other than forensic pathologists, uh, you know, as we see in loads of movies, um, you know, post-mortem work tends to creep up the most, you know, the most frequently, even though um, in quite a civilised country like UK with a, a lot of gun problems, we don't have, fortunately, a lot of forensic death, which <laughs> sort of makes very known for people who do want to go into forensic pathology because there's not that many jobs and there's not as many training posts available. So um, uh, on average, every year, you would have about 10 posts for a whole country coming up to train as a forensic pathologist. So to become a forensic pathologist, if you're very keen, um, you have to apply for histopathology training. Um, you have to complete your first exam in histopathology, and then you have to apply for forensic pathology training. So you still have to enter the route of histopathologist because forensic pathologists still um, need to know some histology work, how to um, look at tissues, how to interpret the tissues under the microscope. Um, but then the training kind of diverges um, after they enter the subspecialty training. Um, w one of my colleagues is, um, is someone who really wants to be a forensic pathologist. And unfortunately, because there's not that many jobs, you, you, you have to make sure that you're very proactive in what you're doing. Um, and do extra courses, extra qualifications, kind of seek audit work, um, try to get in touch and network as much as possible and make some sacrifices. Because as I said, there's not that many jobs in a country, so you probably will have to move away from where you are now. Thanks, Annie. And it's worth, I think you said there were 17 different subspecialties within there, so that there's plenty of other things to get involved yeah. with. Um, absolutely you'll be exploring that as you as you go through medical school and then afterwards in, in, in foundation training so there, there are a few questions here which uh, can apply to, to to both different specialties so there's there's one which asking is asking what is your work work life balance like um, so i think there's this there's the image of a doctor who's working all day and all night so is that true jade how is it for you? I need to get Dave talk a thing of your day. So yeah, so it's very, very variable which specialty you go into, and what stage of your training you're at. Because before going into radiology, I was in A and E for eight months during like the beginning of the first wave of COVID, and that was a lot of shift work. And when I wasn't working, I was sleeping, and then I was trying to fit in my exercise and like my meal prep and everything else along the way. And then currently in radiology, because I'm a first year in radiology, my day is eight fifteen to five, and that's Monday to Friday. You won't find that in many other roles. Once I go into second year, I will have evenings added in. Once I get into fourth year, I'll have night shifts added in as well. But it's just as we get more senior, then in radiology, you have very few radiologists in the department at night. So you need someone that's quite senior. But in other specialties, it's very, very different. So it's really the balance. And that might be like be part of your decision of what specialty you want to go into as well. Thanks, Jade. And just to add, is that different to foundation training at all? So do the hours differ? Yeah, so for foundation training, so um, what I said before, it's like four months in each specialty is generally what's what's done. And in each specialty within foundation training, so you do that for two years if you're not doing it part time. And that will be six different specialties and each specialty will be completely different. So I did psychiatry, which was nine to five, Monday to Friday. And then I did um, that's when I did it, my eight months of A&E as well. So that was doing nights every three weeks. And that'll be four nights in a row, then three nights in a row, then four nights in a row. And then I did 12 midday to 12 midnight shifts and 10 to 10 shifts. So that was very variable. And then I did OBS and Gynae, which was eight to five, Monday to Friday. So it's very, very variable in F1 and F2, so your foundation years. And then it's very, very variable between all the specialties as well. Thanks, Jude. Annie, is, is that uh, similar for you? 
Yes, I concur. So usually during med school, um, your working life is nine to five because that's when medical school works. And even when you're in clinical placement, sometimes you, you can be asked to come a bit earlier just because that's when the surgery, for example, starts start at seven. So you sort of expect to be there at seven. Um, but obviously, you, you, you can only work for so long. So you're allowed to leave earlier. Um, generally, you don't expect it to come at the weekend um, or at nights, but you may choose to do so. Um, and you probably will be very encouraged because there won't be as much competition from other medical students because it's not seen as a very popular time to be in the wards. Oh, sorry. Um, when you become a junior doctor, obviously there are different um, time schedules and you tend to kind of work in shift pattern, just depends what specialties you are. Um, so I was very lucky during my foundation program, I, because I did academic foundation program, um, I, I sort of had a very nice um, collection of rotations and I, um, I managed to get two rotations over Christmas time to be one was our patient psychiatry, the other one was my academic rotation. So I had two Christmases off, um, which doesn't happen very often in, in medicine. Um, but for the other specialties, as Jake was saying, it can be quite grilling, it can be quite very tiring. Switching from nights to days, um, working long days is very tiring. And, um, and that's coming from a person who used to work night shifts during med school. Um, and I thought, I got used to night shifts and it's going to be fine. But actually, when you become older, suddenly everything just becomes a bit harder. And um, as Jit was saying, it's something that does play into um, your decision which specialty in med school, um, sorry, in medicine you want to pursue. So I, I, re I quickly realized that nights are and weekends is not something I want to work long term. I really value my work life balance. Um, I really wanted something that has very regular hours or something flexible to accommodate me. And this is why his pathology is, is very good because um, as I alluded to, you don't have a lot of pressure work. You don't really do on calls. Um, in, in some in some junior Ethan trusts, you may do an occasional weekend when you come on Saturday for a few hours and do some simple reporting um, as, as a trainee, but usually um, but usually it's nine to five. Or a lot of trusts are quite flexible and you can do eight to four or seven to three, depending on what your family life balance is like. We do have people who have kids um, and they can play around with it with the working time and it's quite easy to generally take um, less than full-time training. Thanks, Annie. Um, that's really interesting. And I, I guess it, it varies a bit, doesn't it? And it also depends after you've finished sort of medical school, then once you go into foundation training, it can all vary depending on what specialty you're going into. And so you do need to look at that carefully and when you're at that stage and then just think about what you want your work life balance to be like at that stage. Um, going back to medical school, there are some people who are concerned about the workload actually in medical school what's that like um would you like to give your experiences of that so jay like yeah to... sure so i think it's at medical school it's about finding the balance but it's also finding about what style of lear learner you are so there's different types of um course like medical school so there's some that are very traditional some that do a lot more group work and problem-based learning and then there's some that's just in between and it's finding out what works best for you so i chose problem-based learning which was more sort of we would write our own learning objectives we'll read a case study and then we'll make a plan based off that what we wanted to do for that week and then we had five hours of lectures whereas some medical schools you have nine to five lectures and it's just very very variable so it's finding out your learning style and learning to balance that with your extracurricular activities which are really really important at medical school you get to university there's so much happening and you need to sort of find out if maybe there's a sport you want to try something new or a new society you just need to get involved with those aspects too so at the beginning I would say the work life balance was quite difficult because you just not know what you need to do to pass the exam but then once you sort of get into it and you find out how much you need to do how much time you need to work you can actually get quite a good work-life balance when it comes up to the exam period it can be stressful like the exam you're doing at the moment as well so that's when you might find that you get the balance a little bit wrong or you you sort of sway one way but overall I found it okay thanks Jade Annie what, what would you say about the sort of study life balance I guess at medical school and um, 
I agree with Jay, it can be quite difficult. And I think the overrunning theme of my life so far has been finding my feet. So you enter medical school and you sort of try and find your feet, as Jane was saying, what your learning balance is, um, what's your learning style is, apologies. And then you get to exams and you try to find out what's your revision style is how, how do you do that and then you get to clinical placements and then you go well what's the best way to learn in clinical area because it's so different to the words and then you become a junior doctor and you go gosh how do I find work-life balance there now and how do I combine revision and learning and try to do audit work or something else and then coming into this specialty because again it's so different to what I was doing on the wards it's again finding my feet <laughs> how how do I learn best in this specialty um but, but you adapt, you just learn. Um, usually um, in, in medical school, your kind of first initial time is a bit chill because they know that you're trying to find your feet. Uh, um, and that's when people tend to go out loads and they tend to have um, extracurricular activities. They tend to sign up to 20 different societies because they're so keen they want to try everything and they went to careers fair or societies fair um, and for signing up they got a pizza and a pen so that's a good motivator uh, <laughs> and then and then the reality kicks in and you realize oh I actually have to attend the lectures and um, anatomy classes and communication skills and examination skills and all of all the rest and somehow need to balance it um, so you just learn and I guess it depends what kind of circumstances you're coming from as well, because some people um, are fortunate enough to have support from their family and they're not particularly worried about um, trying to maintain their income. I have um, worked throughout all of my medical school. Uh, so I initially worked in Tesco's on the weekend and then I realised um, that I could have a better work-life balance if I choose um if I choose and swap my career to kind of do healthcare support worker um, as part-time because I can have full flexibility of when I want to work rather than having to rely on Tesco's that you have to come every Saturday. And it also gave me exposure what the life in medicine and in, in the hospital is from the other side. Because as a medical student, you don't really get to see what the nurses really do. Because when you're in placement, you sort of just follow the doctors around. You kind of get attached to them, glue them, and you just follow them around. But you don't really see what the OTs do in the next room, how the nurses care after the patients, you know, what it's really like to be ill in an HS. Um, so you get a better understanding of what it's like in a hospital. So I do I do highly encourage people to do get a job. Um, try not to dive your you know, dive right in and get pick up all the shifts and do detriment of your uni work because that's not very helpful to you in the long run but it's good to have something on the side especially it's very something flexible so you can rely on extra income um generally you don't need loads of money to study medicine um there's initial investment to get a stethoscope um and maybe some medical books but usually all medical schools will have a library so you could go and borrow books um, medical schools are also quite forthcoming in providing you with resources and information. There's lots of also free resources on YouTube, such as kind of examination skills, communication skills, lots of information available um, on these websites. Um, and if you are, say, on placements which are quite distant to where you live, usually med school will be able to help and cover some, some um, amount of money. Um, or if it's very far away, they will provide you with accommodation. So, um, don't be too worried about that side, but be realistic. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of income um, in your family and you don't think you'll have a lot of support from your parents, um, don't try to choose a med school in a very expensive area that, you, you know, you might struggle. So perhaps London might not be the best option because London is notoriously expensive to live in. Thanks, Annie. I think that's a really good point. And, and there are loads of uh, scholarships and bursaries available. So do just do your research, go on all the different websites, have a look at what they have to offer. Um, because what a lot of students forget is the medical schools are trying to sell themselves to you. They want you to come to them and choose them over other medical schools. Um, so do just do your research and find out where would suit you, the different learning styles, the different look at the different um, financial perspectives at each school, think about your own personal life and where, where would suit you. You know, it might be really far away from home and you might not want to do that. 
it, there's so many different decisions that you need to make for yourself and, and that all starts with research. Um, Jade, I, I did want to just touch on that point because I know that you did mention that you did a gap year and that you worked as a healthcare assistant. Um, so I'd just like to ask you, uh, what's that like what that is like because there's someone here asking if you take a gap year what, you sh what should you do so maybe that's a good question for you yeah so I really enjoyed my gap year and I was working full-time as a healthcare assistant in my local hospital in Bristol and it was just getting the experience and understanding all the different roles within the team and not just the doctors not just the surgeons I worked with because I formed closer bonds with the nurses other healthcare assistants for example that were there as well and the porters and everyone and it's, I think for if you want to have a gap year choosing, if you want to find out more about the career, more options, and it's quite good to write in your personal statement, then that can be a good path to go down. But there are lots of other jobs that you might want as well. And it also depends on how much you're getting paid as well, which is important and how flexible the hours are, especially if you want to be spending more time with family during that year as well, especially if you want to move away during medical school, then you want to make the most of that too. So it's finding a a balance of career but I really found healthcare assistant work I found that useful and I think I've learned skills there that I've continued to use and improve on throughout my whole sort of career so far. Thanks Jade and I realize we've slightly overrun but I do have one more question and then I'll finish up. Um, so there's a question here asking if you were in year 12 or 13 again what would you do uh, what would you advise for someone who's looking to get into medicine right now? Um, do you have any advice for them? Jade? Yeah, so I think there's at the moment, it's now that we've moved sort of on lots of things have moved online, I think try and see what else is going on like these webinars that you can go to, because there's actually lots of people out there that really, really want to help tell you about their careers and jobs. And you can find out so much more now just sitting in your living room, sitting in your bedroom, as long as you've able to get a device that you're able to sort of listen to other people find out little tips and tricks and I think that's will be really useful for year 12 and 13 especially it might be hard to get actual work experience at the moment but talking to people about their careers that also is sort of what you're doing in on your work experience and finding out information and that can be useful for you deciding if that's the career for you and also in your personal statement too. Thanks Jade and Annie do you have any last tips for year 12 or 13? I do agree with what Jane said, absolutely. I think the most important thing you should be doing right now is actually trying to decide, is medicine the right special, you know, is it is the right career for you? Um, and I think I concur with everything which Jane said. I would say try and find as much information about this medicine as a career. Try, you know, if you have, if you're registered with a GP practice, you can get in touch and ask if you can speak to one of the GP trainees. Um, rather than to a GP because it might not be to a med school for you know for a very long time there might be quite a, an old GP that might not have um, the full understanding what's it like to be a junior doctor these days or if you do very like the sound of, of one particular medical school you can get in touch with them and say look I'm really trying to find out what's it like and I speak to one of your medical students and they'll you know we're very very likely going to put you in touch with one of the local medical students and there's going to be your opportunity to try and find out more about what what's it like to be a medical student what what's the uni like what's the work-life balance like is it the job that you want to do for the next you know 60 70 years because there's loads of people who kind of go into medicine become quite disillusioned and leave at various stages you know, whether it is med school or it's kind of later on down in life um, when, when they become a junior doctor, it's because medic exodus is quite a big problem. And I think it's because people coming into specialty, into medicine, not realizing what it fully entails. Um, you know, even though I had plenty of work experience, it's, I think it's very difficult to comprehend what it's really is like, because all you do is just sort of follow around or just sit next to a person who does the job. Um, and you just don't really have a full grasp of what's going on, what, res what responsibility you're carrying, what kind of the demands of the jobs are, because you're just sort of there as a floater. You're just like a wee tourist coming, coming around and having a good time, having something to put down in your CV. So my advice is research, 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 make sure you know what you're going into. And then it pays off because if you apply to that med school, you have loads of information to talk about you know the med schools want to see that you've done your research you know why you're coming to their that particular med school uh, they, they want to know that you're not just doing willy-nilly or because a career advisor told you that you're you're gonna 
become a good doctor. They want to know that you want to do it because you want to do it and you're a suitable person. Um, they also want to know that you're human um, rather than someone who's rehearsed for the interview um, or saying things that they think is right. They want to know that you're compassionate, that you know that you're caring, not that you're able to memorize lots of textbooks worth of information. Um, yeah. But, so but, my advice is research. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Annie. And I think we will be having more careers webinars. I've seen that someone in, in there was asking if we're going to offer different specialties. I am working on that. I will find the right people uh, to bring them to you. So hopefully there will be in future uh, webinars on different specialties. Um, but finally, thank you, Jade and Annie, for coming here and speaking to everyone today. Um, I found out so many things I didn't know, so I think other people will have done too. So a uh, huge thanks and I will be logging off now. Thank you.